until Christ is formed. Uh, and so as I explained last week, we want to de deal with the different areas that, con that are um, in conflict with Christ forming in the, on the inside of us. And so I have some people that I want to join me today, and then I'm going to have some um, other people join me today. The first person I'd like to join me is Dr. Emmanuel Neely. Give God praise for our doctor. Isn't that good? join us in this conversation he's going to give us some advice from his level of expertise and I am grateful to be able to pull on this gift amen the next person I would like to join me is Minister Michelle Bennett yes Miss Felicia Towns like Chappelle Marshall to join me. Move over, honey. Thank you. I mean, you've been working out, man and God. Hallelujah. All right. So I'm going to go, my, I, I want to talk from the topic of, uh, we have the mind of Christ. And I also want to navigate through this subtopic um, depression and the church, um, and I want to di really dispel some lies. Um, and so I'm going to start off with letting our panelists introduce themselves, and then from there, we'll just dive into um, this topic, amen? And so we're going to start with um, Chappelle Marshall. He can tell us what his level um, of expertise is and experience and all of that. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chappelle Marshall. I am a licensed graduate level social worker. Um, yes. Praise the Lord. Um, and I do provide therapy services in the District of Columbia um, from ages five to up. So my oldest client right now is, I think, 62. Amen. Felicia Towns. I'm Felicia. And I work in the area of finance, but I'm just a church girl to cancel all the lies when it comes to depression in the church. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I am Michelle Bennett, and uh, I work in, administra in the administrative area and in project management. Lifelong church baby, but I'm glad to be here to help dispel some myths today. Hello, Emmanuel McNeely. Uh, first of all, Grateful to God to be a son of this house. Thank you, Apostle, for this. This is awesome. We got the best leaders, and I'm going to say that. I don't care. I'm going to be 85. They're going to be like, this dude always say the same. I'm going to say the same. I don't care. I can't say nothing. I was right back there, 2019, no money. Everything went uh, real bad, so it's an honor to be sitting up here, and I don't forget that. You know, I don't care what a Monday looked like. I remember 2019, so thank you. Uh, praise God. Uh, so a little bit about myself, uh, my wife, Sarah McNeely, and I, we uh, do. I'm so proud, y'all. I'm sorry. I'm cheesing. Like a... <laughs> there you go, we do uh, uh, community outreach programs in a form of education, medical education. We've been blessed to partner across the country and go speak to students. Even this last week, got more testimonies. We're expanding to help uh, underrepresented minorities enter medicine. Uh, and on the medical side, we're in medicine. I'm going to do orthopedic surgery. Tomorrow, I start a, a month-long rotation at Johns Hopkins for pediatric orthopedic surgery. It's only Jesus. They said it wouldn't happen, but here we are. So if you believe it will happen, if you sow into it, it'll happen. And if you promise to keep God first, there's nothing he will not do. My God. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes, yes. I love that. And since you started talking about um, they said that would not happen, tell us a little bit about your story. Um, you, you testified, uh, or you told me in the midst of your trial about these doctors that did not believe in you. Did that make you feel depressed at all? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, man. let's talk about that. 
So uh, long story short, uh, I come from an area nobody went to college or anything like that. And I, uh, the Lord told me early, and uh, I was about 17 through the mouth of a prophet, you're called to be a physician, you're going to do cures, all this stuff. I'm like, whoa, okay, from this dysfunctional family, uh, you know, I, it's going to be kind of heavy. Long story short, the Lord shifted, and in the darkest of darkest of moments, I'm talking about everything you can imagine, uh, murder around me, dysfunction around me, hatred around me, all within the context of being a church boy. Growing in right here in a pew, uh, the Lord has uh, staffed my life at every place. So uh, 2017, uh, I, uh, it took me five years to get into medical school. Uh, I applied and didn't get in. And every step of the way in my academic career, people say, you can't do this. Do something less. Do, uh, choose the path of least resistance. But I want you to know you're going to be in torment, like Apostle taught us, if you, it's the beginning of the end when you choose not to obey God. That's the beginning of the end. And, and I said, Lord, I, I don't care how long it takes. I'm going to obey. But what does that look like? That looks like uh, me coming here in 2019, uh, uh, family blocked on the phone because the week prior saying, don't go back to that church. This church has been the source. So they said, why is he honoring God? Why is he so happy and excited to be here? I fought for my life to get here. And I had uh, $60 a week set aside. Uh, and I was going through the first six weeks with Pastor Corey, and it was a one-on-one sometimes, uh, walking, exploring the Bible, and going through the foundations. So why do I get so excited about that class? Because that class was 60 minutes of my life where there was no torment. 60 minutes of my week were no torment. Working 70 hours a week at one of the most touted institutions, walk in and don't know why people hate the juice on my eyeballs. But then at the same time, Lord opening me into praying for people in private rooms. Uh, Apostle Stevenson even prophesied and stood me up and said, there is an entire organization against you. So, Apostle, to answer your question, I've had doctors in every field. Don't do this. These programs, don't do that. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? To this day, national platforms, national news, local news, the Lord has blown on it because we would not refuse our yes to him. So right now, it's a blessing. Even in this last year, uh, fighting against organizations, I've had... Um, without getting too specific until I fully come through uh, a graduation in April. Uh, <laughs> my God. One teacher says something about you in 2017. Another teacher says, hey, there's a thing called confirmation bias and all of that. Uh, you know, uh, this is what we think about you. I was on calls with nine individuals, all very high ranking. Uh, we think you have academic deficiencies. I published eight papers nationally on stages. They're using me for, uh, to raise money. They're using me to meet dignitaries. I'm meeting the mayor, everyone else. The next day, we think you have an issue. We think you have academic, we're concerned. Really what they're saying is the power that is in you, we can't label it, we don't know what it is. And as a result, we're gonna do everything we can to kill it. I had one person in, in all of these meetings, I probably had 30 meetings since I began, one teacher, think, they think you don't care. They don't know what the peace of God looks like. I do care. And then the Lord just opens up so many doors. So I'm going to end by saying this. Accusation, don't allow it to define you. You got to know what God said about you more than what the enemy said about you. And every time he opens a door, we can sit here and testify for three hours. I just want you to know the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. His word don't change. So if his word doesn't return void to him, I don't care what it looks like last week or this week. God is sovereign. That's it. Yes, he is. We know that Satan uses depression to fill our minds with darkness. He fills our minds with lies, and he makes us feel like there is no hope. Um, Michelle, I want you to tell us about your Damascus Road experience. Wow. Um, okay. That's, it. That's easy. So growing up in, in the church as a pastor's child, um, I was taught in the ways of the church. So I was taught how to look the part, dress the part, um, know what to say with the part, but not really to just be, right? And so I learned how to effectively mask uh, what was really happening mentally, uh, internally, and uh, because I was just doing enough to get along because that's what pastor's children were supposed to do. You weren't supposed to talk back. You weren't supposed to ask questions. You were just supposed to be in place, do what you do, sing your little song, put your robe on, and do all of that. Uh, and I was able to do that for decades. 
I would work in different churches and because people were enamored with what I could do, no one cared about what was happening on the inside. When I would get in the car, it was hard for me to get to, it was tears to get to the church. I would get to the church and then leave the church. Everybody else was shouting and I was going home depressed. I was going home thinking, what just happened in church? I don't even know what the preacher say. I don't know. And then I came across a church on Park Heights Avenue. And I remember meeting with Apostle Stith. We had lunch, and I was telling her what my condition was. And I didn't really give her a lot of background, but, but you know she sees everything, right? She didn't say much. She just sat there, and she smiled. And I was telling her what I was dealing with at the church because I could just, I knew when to wave my hand. I wasn't even paying attention in church. I knew when to do like this. I knew when to stand up. But when I, and I told her, I was just feeling like I was just betwixt, caught between two worlds. And I came to the church and I was like, oh my God, oh my God. I'm just gonna sit here. I'm not doing much of anything. I'm just, I just wanna sit, ha ha, right. But coming here made me confront what was really going on because I could no longer hide behind the mask because nobody cared what I could do. Nobody cared how well I could sing. It didn't matter. What mattered most was the condition of my soul. So my Damascus Road experience was a, a, a chronicling of events from the time I joined in December of 2017 up until this point. Because there are layers to this. There are layers. You get so far and you're like, oh, okay, I'm good. And then you hear a sermon and it's like, oh, okay, maybe I'm not, you know. Mm. Maybe I'm ready. Oh, no, I'm going back in the dark room. No, I'm not ready. And there have been things that made me confront, that made me talk, that made me be honest with God. And first, when I finally said to God, I can no longer live like this because if I continue to live like this, I'm going to be in the grave because I wanted to die, because I didn't feel like I had any life left in me. I was purely existing. I don't know if anyone has ever been there, but just existing. It's like I was riding on skates and just could, okay, here I am. Nobody cares. That's what the enemy was lying about. But when I found out that that I, I had that moment where it says, step into the light, Carol Ann, step into the light, Michelle. <laughs> After, Everybody know that movie? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> step into the light, Carol Ann. And in a deliverance moment, I remember I was on this floor and I think Apostle said, she saw me going in and out of uh, doors, like it was a um, revolving door, and she pulled me out of that door. And I saw the light of Jesus Christ shine in that situation. That is powerful. That is powerful. So how many times would you say you went in and out of that revolving door? Probably twice a year. Because there were, as we know, it's, a, it's a cyclical. Year. It's cyclical. It, sometimes it happens with this uh, season changing, like fall to winter for me. So I've learned now how to arm myself with certain tools so I don't fall into that place of not wanting to get up, not wanting to talk, yeah. You know, there's a lie in the church that says that Christians can't be depressed. Um, and as a Christian who was depressed, um, I do know that that is a lie. I know that discouragement can lead us to depression if we let it. Discouragement brings about hopelessness. And really, my take on depression is the reflection on thoughts that are unfruitful. It's a reflection on thoughts that are unfruitful. Um, depression is, I believe, a spirit. I do know that it can be a chemical imbalance. I'm gonna get to that in a minute. Um, but from, the, from the, the vantage point of discouragement, Felicia, have you ever felt discouragement or disappointment that led you to depression? I have. So 
I can talk about a recent experience just almost a year ago now um, that I went into, I went through transition with jobs and I was trying to figure out, you know, what was, what was I going to do next? I'm, I'm that person where I'm going to save so much money. I live by this. What if, what if this happened? What if this happened to the point where that moves you into fear? You start, you know, not wanting to spend or enjoy life or different things like that. But in this moment of going through this transition, I became very discouraged and very disappointed because I'm like, I have 13 years here. Like, how dare you decide that you want to do something different? Yeah. So from that point, I found myself falling into depression. And when I fell into this level of depression, I went into isolation. That's one thing the enemy would try to do. If he gets you by yourself in a room with your own thoughts, that is the most devastating thing that could have ever happened to me. I cut off relationships. I got to a point where I was still coming to church. Yeah, don't, because don't I couldn't twisted. reach her. Yeah, couldn't reach her. She me. was coming to church but ducking me. Yes, ma'am, running out that door. <laughs> I'm done and not answering my calls. That part. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm bringing that out because it's a real thing. Yeah. And she's telling you the flip side of it. She said it was the most devastating thing yeah. that she could have chosen to do. Yeah. yeah, so I was ducking and dodging. I was coming to church still, you know, doing my church girl things. I've been doing this all my life. So I know what to do. I know the ropes, know how to look the part. But folks don't even know what's happening and what's going on. I definitely didn't want to see the woman of God. So I definitely, when I got through, I was gone out the door. I was, I was running for dear life. <laughs> Because I said, if, if I see her, if I get in her presence, she's going to start asking questions. She just have this anointing where she start probing. And the questions would just have you tell on your own self. I said, my God. But that was one of the most devastating things I could have did. I cut off covenant relationships because I did not want people to know what I was dealing with. Even in that moment of depression, it led me to the bottle. Oh, I'm going there. Talk to us. It led me to a place where I felt like it was comfort for me. So I started drinking. Still in the church. This Talk to us. Started drinking and saying, oh, this feel real good. <laughs> I had those moments of tips in them, those moments where I'm like, oh, this is working for me. Talk but at the us. same time. They don't, want, they don't like this no, kind of No, they don't truth, like this Felicia. gospel. They don't like this gospel. <laughs> but I'm a witness that the answer is not in the bottle. Woo! But the answer is in Jesus Christ. I'm not, come, I'm not, I'm not going there just You better yet. come up. I feel the preacher coming yeah, and rising. Is. Good God Almighty. And I had to learn in that moment that that wasn't the answer. I had to get to a point where I said, okay, Felicia, what's going to happen next? And it was a phone call. I don't even know, the, I don't even know if I shared this part. Apostle, I finally answered the phone. And Apostle said, Felicia, get up from there. It's time to fight. It was those simple words. I wasn't in church. I wasn't, I wasn't in no deliverance line. I was sitting on side the bed with me a bottle of tequila trying to figure life out and the woman of God said Felicia get up from there it's time to fight and in that moment I felt the help of the Lord I, if, I, if I didn't feel nothing else I felt the fear of the Lord I said well let me put this baller down because she, she must be seeing something around the corner over there <laughs> but in that moment I felt help from the sanctuary the scripture is true I felt the help from the sanctuary I felt strength from the Lord I felt the saints praying for me. And I knew then, Felicia, you can't hide here any longer. First of all, you got to let somebody know what's going on. You got to be honest about where you are. You have to be honest and let them know, yeah, I've been drinking, trying to figure life out. But here I am, Lord. Do what you need to do to get me back to a right standing and a right place in you. So I thank God, although I've been in church all my life, I'm going to tell the story. It's a real thing. Depression is real. Don't let the folks fool you and tell you that you can't be saved and be depressed. Because I'm here to tell you. It'll creep up on you and have you doing things you thought you never would have done before in your life. I'm done. I, feel I absolutely love that, Felicia. Because, you know, even in your hiding and you yeah. can, trying to continue to function, you got upset with me because yeah. I interrupted your plan. Wow. What did I do? I disconnected those emails because she was still emailing. Ooh. She was still doing the church work. And I, we wasn't having conversations. And I was like, what is happening? What's going on? But I knew what was happening. Behind the scenes, she was doing what she always did. She was taught to work through it. As a PK, she was taught to function. She was taught... You know, even in the midst of it, nobody should, should ever know. You know, she was taught all of these things. And so I said, wait, we got to stop here. 
And when I did that, I don't think she fully understood that because we had a conversation. I don't know if she wants to go here. She said, please don't do that. <laughs> but she was hurt through the misunderstanding of some things that I had, some hard conversations that I had to have with her. But in the midst of it, I am so grateful that you are on the other side of it. He is so good. He is so good. I'm grateful to be that type of leader. I'm sitting here listening to the testimonies and sometimes you don't know that you are appreciated and you don't know that you are effective. Those are two different things, but you want to know that you are effective and sometimes, um, no, I won't say that. Yeah, I'll just say you want to know that you are effective. And so hearing this communication, this feedback is very, very, very encouraging because I am the type of leader that will step in your world. And it will be, it may not be through a 30-minute counseling session. It might be through a two-minute conversation. And you got to learn how to hear it and let the words land where they need to land so that it interrupts the process of hell in your life. Amen, because I know what it feels like to be in darkness. Yeah. I know what it feels like to lay in rooms for hours and for days, and my husband is a witness, with the, uh, the, the curtains drawn, not cleaning your house. Yeah. And 22, I lived in depression for 22 years from the time I was four years old through my early 20s, and God interrupted that process in my life. I had a friend that came in, my house, she's still my best friend, best friend of 32 years. And she came in my apartment and opened the curtains, pulled the curtains back. And I, I put, the, put my hand over my face and I was just like, I didn't want to talk, I didn't want to associate. But all I knew, I, all I knew was darkness. Yeah. And I had not been exposed yet to the light of Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you something, as a survivor of two nervous breakdowns, coming out of that and being on the other side, now a deliverer. I understand the need for somebody else to come in and interrupt the plan and the process of hell in your life. Some people don't understand it, but it's the love of God when he will send a person to interrupt the plan of hell in your life. Like Felicia said, she said that phone call, that phone call changed it all. I remember my sister, I'll share this testimony, watching my sister walk through the same level of depression that I walked through and being that person that my best friend was to me. I went in her apartment and I opened the curtains. You're depressed. Sometimes you don't know you're depressed. Yeah. Sometimes you just feel like you're tired. Sometimes you just feel like you're weighted. Sometimes you feel like you're, the, you're carrying the world on your shoulders and you're just trying to figure it out. The enemy will tell you you just need more time yeah. to figure it out. But no, sometimes you have to open your mouth and throw out the lifeline, right? I ask, you need that lifeline thrown yeah. out to you, somebody to come in and rescue you. So I'm grateful. Yeah. I'm grateful. And so as a result of being a survivor, each and every one of you, um, of depression, you become the lifeline for somebody else because you know the signs, you know the signals, you know, you know what it looked like. Now, Chappelle, you are a therapist. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. But you are also one that lived in depression. Half. So tell me about your story. <laughs> tell me about um, your story, how, how you, what was that like for you? But also tell me about um, what do you think about um, this term that I addressed recently on social media? Um, the person said, depression cannot be cast out. Depression has to be treated with medicine. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's definitely not true. Um, well, first, just by way of testimony. Wait, how many of you all believe that all depression is chemical? Okay, good. Go ahead. Yeah, no. Um, so I tried to get this degree, Apostle, in 2013, and I failed out of school. And so for a couple of years... I just was going to work, you know, doing the routine, and just, I had completely said I wasn't going to do it. Um, in 2017, my wife came to me with an acceptance letter and said, 
here you go. And I looked at it and I was like, well, what is this? She was like, well, you have new student orientation on blah, 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 date and time. So this woman of God then went, then signed me up for school and told me I was going to school. Praise the Lord. I love that. And Keep then, talking. Look, and then went with me to the new student orientation to make sure I got. Uh, so, but, but even after That's that. That's a good wife. That is a good wife. Yes. Y'all pray for her. <laughs> <laughs> but then we even, love you, Lashonda. We know you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> but then even after that, uh, when I started school, the first year, the agency that I did my internship closed. So that was blow number one. So they told me that I need, I'm, I'm feeling emotional about it because I thank God for this journey. They told me that I would have to start over yeah. wow. in 2017. So we worked that out. Thank you, Lord. I sold my seed that year for um, paid in full, and the Lord showed up. Not only did they tell me I had to start over, I then lost my job after six years. So in 2018, my mom passed. That was another blow. So that's when I really started to feel this depression. Um, and the way that it was coming out was eating. So I was Talk eating. About it. I mean, I was, eat I was eating and drinking, woman of God. Oh Praise God. his high name. Jeez. And it wasn't good for me to eat and drink because I was on medication. But uh, we're going to pray about that too. Uh, but but this is real. Talk See, yeah, I want to, I, we we gonna talk real. We gonna talk. We gonna talk. All right. And so not only was I eating and drinking, I just was very very down and sad. And I remember coming to church. I think we had a um, apostle had texted me and said, "I want you to be on the panel." And I said, "This woman of God, she I think I don't even know if she know, but all right, I'm coming to be on the panel." And we happened to be dealing with mental health. And after the panel was over, we were standing right over here, and I was talking. I, ain't, I was like, I don't even know if she listened. <laughs> but I know she tries to do, like, a couple of things at once. So I'm talking, and she says, you need to get a therapist, and walked off. <laughs> and I said, well, good God. <laughs> so, so I went and found me a therapist, praise the praise Lord. Praise the Lord. But then, this is, this is, this is the cycle of depression, because... They're triggers to your depression. You, you, and this is what you have to identify. In order to get to the root, you have to identify the trigger. Amen. And so then in 2019, I got sick. All while trying to get this degree. And so it just, it was blow after blow after blow after blow. Then the pressures of being a father. The pressures of being a husband. You got bills. You got this and you got that. You're taking care of this for this person. You're over here doing this. For, and so it just, it was so bad. It was so bad. I think I wanted to like run and hide. I really did. I would come to church and I would sit, you know. The thing about me is, and I used to say this all the time, which is not a good thing. You'll never know what I'm going through. Y'all know y'all say that, right? You'll never know what I'm going through. That's really not good. Somebody should know you're going through something, right? Um, but the joy of the Lord. Oh, y'all ain't get excited. I thought y'all was going to The joy of the Lord was my strength. And why do I say that? I say that because that was what got me through the word of God, prayer, being honest, being transparent. It don't always got to be Apostle Stiff. Because she got a lot to do. So you got brothers and sisters in here that you can, you got a whole line of elders. Praise the Lord. You got a whole line of clinical people. Praise the Lord. That you can go and talk to to help you get to where you need to get to. So it took me being honest, me going to therapy, and me realizing that if it had not been for him, you understand what I'm saying? Where would I be? So I just kept, I, I, with, with, I've always felt like I've been a strong person. But when depression hits you, it really does debilitate you. It can put you down. The clinical term for it is that if you cannot attend to your daily living skills, like taking a shower, going to work, you know, doing the daily living tasks, cleaning your house, then you are 
you're, we would rather we would gather that you're depressed, yes. right? Um, within our realm of work, there has to be like a time frame attached to it. However, yeah. most times we would would look at you and say, yeah, that's that's a clinical depression, right? Now, as it relates to this this whatever about I don't even know who said it or why they said it, but well, it's, no, a, it's a belief uh, among Christians as well. You know, not just the world, but mm -hmm. they, some Christians, some people believe that it is not a spirit, and I believe that that's from the persuasion of those that don't believe in yeah. deliverance yeah. overall. But yeah, well, I've seen, I've been in sessions. Yeah, Apostle, I when I start my session, sessions. The last thing I say before I get on is let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. When I log in, I'm asking the Lord for clarity and for sight because I don't want to just be clinical by book, but I want to be the deliverer that God has called me to be. And so I've seen in session where I've had uh, um, clients who have been uh, uh, anxious and, and having nervous breakdowns. I'm talking about day after day. And they come to one of my sessions, and we have a breakthrough as it relates to our what we're talking about. You know, I'm, we have a breakthrough, and then I discharge them, and they go about their life, right? But you have to be willing to put in the work. You have to be willing to be honest, and you have to be willing to accept that this is a problem, and I want to change it. Absolutely. It is identifying the problem. What would be some signs, Dr. Emmanuel? I know that you've gone through different studies and you've been in the psych wards and all of that stuff. What would be some signs, some things that we could say that would distinguish a person needing medication versus a person needing deliverance? Ooh, that is so good, Apostle. Um, uh, where did it come from? We got to get to the root of the thing. So we get trained in medicine. Uh, we could talk about symptoms and signs all day. That's the manifestation of a deeper root. Uh, so real quick before I uh, forget, uh, what Chappelle was talking about was humility. You got to have humility and say, I need help. And this spirit of pride wants to keep you in chains. So God gives grace to the humble. His grace is sufficient. You got to humble yourself and then get what you need. So that's the first thing. So when we go through diagnostics, Apostle, you ask what signs are. Uh, clinical signs, we have an uh, acronym, but sleep disturbance, uh, your interest, you know, what you used to love, you're not interested anymore. It's called an anhedonia. Uh, and then I'm guilt. Anhedonia. Yes, I like it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, guilt or feelings of worthlessness. Um, you know, eating habit changes. You're eating more, eating less not wanting to eat, concentration disturbances, uh, appetite suppression, your appetite is grown or changed, psychomotor retardation, which means you're moving slower, you're talking slower. You ever looked at somebody and say, ooh, you know, that's just heaviness on you. And lastly, uh, suicidal thoughts, and that timeline is two weeks or more. But check this out, Apostle. The notion that it can't be spiritual is a lie because the word said, put on a full garment of praise, take off the spirit of heaviness. What is the spirit of heaviness? And, and even clinically, I've done um, uh, large uh, research projects that have shown depression, clinical depression prior to receiving a major surgery for sickness leads to worse outcomes. And we studied over a thousand patients. Also, if you break your hip and you're over a certain age, there are many studies out there that say there are about three things that will indicate mortality, dying within a year. And one of it is a delay to get help. We have three indicators. If you break your hip, you have a window to get help. So a lot of us saying we strong, we don't need help. That will kill you, literally. And I'm talking scientifically. I can pull up papers in the back, and we can have an hour discussion on that. Also, y'all yeah, know he would do it. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Because I'm passionate about it. Because it's so. And then also, um, uh, I know it's spiritual because it's bloodline. One of the predictors of suicidal risk. We ask, are there any previous attempts? Is anybody in your family try to do it? Now, I got scripture, I got studies, and I got risk factors that say this is a spiritual bloodline curse. We are believers. Jesus came so he, we can be free. We can have abundant life. Deliverance is the children's bread. We're sons and daughters of God. We need deliverance, and it's a spirit of heaviness. You know, I've had people say to me that, they, you know, they, that their doctor has recommended medication, um, and I try not to get in involved in that level of discussion but as for me personally 
I, I think that medication should be a last it's resort. A last resort. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I think that medication should be it a is. last resort. If you've not, um, if you've not applied the word of God to your life, if you've not taken your thoughts captive, um, in the Philippians two and five it says, "Let this mind be in you that is also in Christ Jesus." Right, and then the Bible says, "Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness." Then the Bible says, "So the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy." And then the Bible what says. Come on, you understand what I'm saying? The Bible gives us so much ammunition to fight against it. But most of the time, what I'm hearing is people are not applying the word. I have heard people literally tell me I am too tired to fight. I am too tired to to, to, to uh, read my scriptures and I say if you can't read them listen to them yes. there is a way around it but what you need is a strong person in your corner to help you through it but isolation a refusal to seek help all of those things are uh, weapons that Satan will use against you to keep you in bondage I know people that have had medication mm -hmm. and are still depressed yes. And I say, if that medication is not helping you, it is a spirit, and you need to let it go. There are medications that will make you worse off than you were before you started. If you're taking medication for depression and all of a sudden you're suicidal, then what is the purpose of taking medication? If medication makes you want to drive off of a cliff, would I rather um, confront weariness and, 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 and depression versus dealing with the spirit of suicide? Yes. I do know that there are people that are clinically depressed. And when, I, when I say clinically depressed, I mean in need of medication. Yeah. But being in need of medication for a chemical imbalance um, can also lead, open the door to other spirits that accompany depression. So just because you need a, uh, a person may need a pill to help stabilize them chemically, it does not mean that you do not need deliverance because you might need a pill to stabilize you chemically, but the door open to other things that you need to be delivered from because Satan is a legalist, right? And I don't want to take this and turn this into a, dis, a, a yeah, deliverance. You could go, woman but go. I'm telling you, he's a legalist. And for many of you, you have believed what your doctor said yeah. over the report of the Lord. And that is why you are in the condition that you are in. Let me tell you what's really wrong. Tell us. What's really wrong. I'm sorry, I'm getting stirred up. And I, I, I told her I wasn't going to preach. What's really wrong is, is you were raped as a child and you never dealt with it. What's really wrong is you are depressed you were depressed as a child because you were tormented if you were like me a person that was locked in closets and you don't deal with that come on you'll carry that over into your adulthood and you will think that you need medicine but what you really need is a deliverance worker you need somebody with the power of God again let me say this for those of you that are recording I'm not saying that some people a few people don't need uh, medication but what I I am saying is the majority of us we need the power of God to enter our life and we need somebody with the power on their life to call the devil out of our mind to call the devil out of our spirit so that Christ can be formed the reason why Christ can't be formed is because your mind has been hijacked and if you get free in your mind everything else will follow I'm telling you something there is power in the name of Jesus and I say it because I am under Vosata because I live through it and I know it works I have lived through it and I know people that have lived through it I got people sitting in here right now that were suicidal that I laid my hands on and cast the devil out of them and they are now in their right mind they're fulfilling their ministry and Christ is being formed in them I know it works I know it works I know it works the devil is a liar come on in here he's a liar I'm sorry I'm sorry Jesus, we glorify you. Jesus, we lift you high. Come on in here. Come on. Some of you are depressed because that husband left you. 
you can't get over. You're not. You're not letting it go. Some of you are depressed because you won't forgive. Some of you are the Some of you are pressed because you're wounded by the words of your mother. You're wounded by the words of your father, or you're wounded because of the lack thereof. But in the name of Jesus, Christ has the power to heal. Christ has the power to liberate. He has the power to set free. Yes, He does. Yes, He does. Yes, he does. Come on, somebody say, yes, he does. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, I give you permission to enter into every dark space. Every dark space in my mind, come on in here. My heart has been heavy. If it's you, tell them, tell them, tell them. But in the name of Jesus, I come to you in honesty. I come to you in humility. Hey, I feel your glory, God. I come to you asking for help. I come to you asking for help. Come on, lead me where I need to go. Come on, if you be a therapist, ask him for it. If you've not been in therapy, ask him for the right person. If you've not had a so tired, if you've not been a participant of deliverance, ask him for it. In the name of Jesus, I am, I am a witness that God can meet you in your bedroom. I am a witness that if you call on the name of the Lord, come on, he will deliver. I am a witness. I am a witness if, if you meditate on the goodness of God, uh, it will change your story. I am a witness. I am a witness. Depression has permission to exist because of a meditation on an impure thoughts. He said, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. He's as he's literally saying, invite him allow him if you are not if you are not a person that forgives it means you're meditating on the bad you're meditating on what somebody did to you or did didn't do for you those are impure thoughts the bible says to what think on these yes, things think on things that are what come on in here let's walk through the word that are what pure come on that are what of a good report come on in here think on these things you said might be saying I, I i just you know i my, my mind is just scattered out i just don't i just don't know your thoughts are not more powerful than god some of you need to ask god for a moment of grace a moment of grace so that you can invite him into that space, that space that has been dark. Some of you are depressed because you're disappointed, yes. not just with people, but with God. Yes. 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 Some of you are depressed because you felt like, you feel like God didn't come through for you at a particular time in your life. Yes. There are roots. Yes, it is. If you deal with the root, It'll heal the whole tree. Yeah. We have 18 minutes. Come on, somebody give God praise. First Corinthians 2 16 says, But we have the mind of Christ. When you came into Christ, when you ask God into your heart, into your mind, when his spirit enter into you, you have access to the mind of Christ. You have access. You have access. He's in you. He's in you. The hope of glory is in you. The eternal one is in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Clap your hands and give God praise. Our thoughts have the power to paralyze us or motivate us. What were some moments, I'm going to ask each one of you, Chappelle, I know you wanted to say something, I'll give you space in a moment, but what were some moments that you, f you feel like um, you were paralyzed by your thoughts? Any one of you? Well, yeah, so I, a couple of things. Medicine was never designed to heal us. It's designed to, to treat, right? Treat but that does treat the symptoms, not designed to allow us to overcome the symptoms. Wow. And so 
it's already doing bad for us because medicine was never designed for so that. So if it was just meant to treat the symptoms, Chappelle. So what you were saying is correct, Apostle, because it allows us the opportunity to be in a, a state of mind, or it should, that's what medicine should do, be in a state of mind to have a clear thoughts to deal with the root, right? That's honestly why but one- But some people just take the medication. And think that that's it. But they won't deal they with They won't the do the work, yeah. Um, so that's, that's just a sidebar. But Ooh. to your other question, um, there were a lot of times where I felt like no one saw me. There were a lot of times where I felt like, even when, especially when my mom passed, so there are a couple of things that really get us to the points of depression. And, 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 and trauma, grief and loss are major ones. Um, so mine's ended up being a <laughs> serious telling the story. Mine's ended up being grief and loss, right? And so some of my thoughts were no one understands what I'm going through. No one sees the hurt and the pain. You know, everybody, I feel like people were saying, get over it, she's gone, things like that. And then so I would tell myself, well, you will feel better if you eat. You love eating, so f get something good to eat, you'll feel better, right? If you have a drink, you know, it might disorient you to the point where you don't feel pain, things like that. So you're, li you're literally telling yourself, yourself these things, and that's why it's so important to stop those negative thoughts. And that is why it's so important to be in your word. Because the only way to combat those thoughts is by the word of God. If you could, the, the, when the Bible says that uh, finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor. I see y'all think that that's to go war against somebody else's devils. No, that's for you to war against your own devils. Oh, come on. When you put your head, when you put your helmet on, right? When you shod your feet, when you have the belt of truth, when you have uh, 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 your shield of faith, those things combat those thoughts that are in your mind. Listen, I'm going to tell y'all something. And I, Felicia knows this. A couple people know this. But you were talking about drinking. And I would tell you, there was a moment in during the pandemic, I told Felicia, I said, Felicia, the devil keep talking to me about taking a drink. <laughs> and I was the wrong one to be taking. Listen. <laughs> now, now, I did not take a drink. But I, I, was, I, was, I was telling somebody as a point of accountability because it would happen at night and I would be in the middle of trying to go to sleep. I'm, I think I told you, didn't I, babe? Yeah, I did. He's smiling. I'm telling you all. I'm, I'm telling you. The reason why I'm sharing this with you because I want you to know that you do not have to fall into the trap. You do not have to fall into the trap. The devil was talking to me and telling me you will f that same thing. You will feel better if you take a drink. Immediately, look at y'all, tighten it up, loosen up in here. Immediately, I know it is. Immediately, the Holy Spirit said, started reminding me of my bloodline. Started telling me why I could not uh, afford afford to fall into the trap. I have a bloodline, look at y'all. <clears throat> my father is an alcoholic. My grandfather was a drinker. My, all of my uncles are alcoholics. As a matter of fact, we went to the family, we went to the family house, they prepared a whole meal. I hope they're not watching, I love y'all family. And all of my uncles was as low as they could get. I mean, when I tell you, I can't say, can I say? They was that kind of drunk that you know what they talk how they how they call it. I can't I don't know if that's a curse word or not. So I want I want to I want to say, but they were ripped. Do you hear me? Everybody around me was ripped. Do you hear me? And in my mind, when I walked into that backyard, my heart began to swell with gratitude because you've got to know the devil's in your bloodline. Somebody else might be able to take a glass of wine. 
And you can't take a glass of wine because if you take a glass of wine, it's going to turn into four or five. If you take a glass of wine, it's going to turn into tequila. If you take a glass of wine, it's going to turn into the hard brown stuff because the devil knows what's in your bloodline. So when he was talking to me, he was trying to trap me like he did so many during the pandemic. So many people became drunks during the pandemic. I'm sorry. I am not talking about your glass of wine. Your one glass of wine. I'm talking about those of you that sat with the entire bottle. <laughs> Paul says they want a glass of wine is good for your belly. It's good for my belly. But not the whole barrel. Some of you are guzzlers. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Y'all are turning up harder than the world. Sorry. <laughs> I went to my naturopathic doctor and I'm going to go back to this and um, my naturopathic me and my husband we visit him once a year and he said I want you to do um, what they do in the blue zones and I was like well what is a blue zone and he said the blue zone in the blue zone the people live very very long you know about the blue zone yeah he just said the blue zone he said one of they take a nap in the middle of the day he said, he said a, a power nap. They take a power nap in the middle of the day. He said they have a high hobby that they never stop. So, for instance, if they're gardening, if they're golfing, whatever, they continue to do those, um, those practices throughout until they can't do it anymore. He said they drink a small, um, small glass of wine at night before they go to bed. He said they only eat beef uh, twice a day no more than twice a week. And there was one other thing that he said, I, I can't remember. And so I went home and I said, man, I'd like to do this, right? I was like, but I started weighing. Will this glass, will this small glass of wine turn into a bottle? I started weighing it. And those are the types of questions that you have to ask yourself. Because if you do what Everybody, what, what that doctor says to do, he does, he's not aware of my bloodline. He, he might not, he might not think, he didn't think, of course he's a believer, anything was wrong with that. But for, as for me, um, I have to lean in to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say. Because the Holy Spirit knows me. He knows our tendencies. He knows, he knows where the devil is trying to trap us, right? All right. Same question. Um, do you remember the question? No, but I think I got an answer. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> we have nine minutes. Come on. One of the things that I can say that I sit with is the fact that I was really upset with God. There you go. And in those moments, it was like, God, I'm in church. Sunday, Wednesday, been in church all my life. And you mean to tell me that you would allow this to happen? I, I'm going to tell you, I even went here. I said, I got a church full of prophets. Ain't nobody seen none. Ain't nobody said none. Mighty. <laughs> ain't, ain't, ain't nothing happening. Mighty so God. I, I just became indignated. Mighty. I cannot be in no apostolic prophetic house. Ain't nobody got no word. Don't nobody see what's happening. No, nobody. <laughs> My God. <laughs> and I, in that moment, I became upset with God. Like, how could this be? But at the same time, God was trying to get me to a place where that same word that them prophets studied, the same God that they come and pray to, you got a whole Bible, you got you, a whole relationship with me, you ought to be able to come and get some answers for yourself. So and I and sometimes God will cover it. He will hide it from the prophets. That part. And it's not necessarily because... Of, of anything that he's trying to teach you, it's his grace. Yeah. Because he said that some sins are covered. Yeah. He covers them until he needs them to be exposed. Go ahead. Amen. That was, that was good right there. And in that time, I'm probably glad he covered it. Because I didn't want to be exposed. <laughs> now that I think about it, thank you for covering me, God. 
Thank you for your grace. <laughs> Up in here doing our landing, here come the word to exposure. I'm good. I'm good. I love all y'all. I thank God for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a real thing. I was upset with God. I became frustrated with God till I found myself not wanting to pray, not wanting to get in the word. Not at one point, not wanting to come to church just to do what I'm supposed to do. Because as Apostle said, I'm a workaholic. I'm still working through that. And I just, you know, I hid behind my work. I hid behind what I do. And so I had to come to a place where at the end of the day, when I think about it now with where I am, I still believe there was a setup from God because I would not trade where I am right now yes. of what I went through to get here. So. Yes. Michelle? I have to say um, fear of loss uh, because uh, I went through uh, several years ago an eviction and I went through foreclosure and I went through loss of a job. Um, and so every time something, I had a, a, an overflow built up in cash or I was always fearful of the shoe dropping that I was going to lose something. Even when I moved into the place where I live now, it took me two years to buy. I had gotten rid of uh, the old furniture that I had in my old place. And it took me two years to furnish the living room in where I currently live because I kept thinking, let's keep everything boxed up because I might have to move. Wow. So sometimes wow. the enemy would use that, and I know I'm not the only one in the room. You got he some would, witnesses that's yeah, hopping out right now. He would use that to keep me from living. Yeah. Whoa. Because you're always thinking of, I'm living, to, I'm living but I'm going to lose yeah. instead of I'm living to live. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anytime I lost something, everything compounded that fear of loss. So my mother passed, fear of loss, uh, 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 loss of friendships that compounded that. So then I would have more stuff in boxes. Let me box this up. Let me box this up and not unpack anything. Just enough to get by. Still smiling, still coming to church. Hallelujah. That is so powerful. How many of you all have lived through that? Jesus, I feel the I feel the glory of God coming in. God is ministering to some of you right now. But you can overcome that. Talk to him. You can overcome that. I went and purchased a couch and I went and purchased a desk uh, because even during the pandemic, I, I saw people that were losing their jobs and I said, God, I'm barely doing anything. Are they going to get rid of me? But in the midst of that, God promoted even in the midst of the pandemic. Yeah, so I'm not saying that about natural things, but I'm saying that God can bring you through. Be honest with him. Yeah. I had a doctor, my primary care doctor, ask me a series of questions and to prescribe medication for depression for me. After asking me 16 questions, just 16 questions and prescribe medication for me. And I got the medication because I said, well, I'm gonna take this. And then I said, I remember texting Apostle and I said, I'm not taking this. I don't care what they say. I'm not taking this medication. And I did not, and I have not, because I began to think on those things that were lovely, those things that were pure, those things that were of good report. If there was any virtue, if there was any praise, God, I praise you because you woke me up this morning. You allowed me to open the blinds today. You allowed me to wash my backside today. I'm grateful. You allowed me to get up and go outside and walk today. That's something to think on. That's praiseworthy. I'm not locked up in an asylum. That's praiseworthy. Just lift your hands and worship for a moment. God, as you're forming yourself in us, as we're becoming more like you, as our thoughts are becoming more like you, we make a commitment 
we make a commitment to surrender our thoughts and our emotions in the name of Jesus Christ. Same question, Dr. Manny. Um, I love what everybody said because depression is so sneaky and the enemy wants you to think you're the only one. Um, you get coached by disappointment. And a lot of thoughts that the enemy comes to you, oh, this is like that. This is like that. So for my testimony, uh, uh, I deep-rooted rejection, abandonment, didn't know that was uh, there, got deliverance. And any time disappointment would come, oh, see, that's that again. Oh, see, there you go. Fear of failure was coaching me. And even if it boosted, uh, uh, per, uh, even if it yielded me good results, it was still my coach. And the Lord reminded me, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Wait a minute, pause. You say even if it yielded you good results. Talk to the, talk about what does that look like? Uh, with fear of failure can make you a high achiever. Yes, ma'am. Perfectionism is rooted in fear. Some of the most talented people, if I'm studying 13 hours, but my driving force is I might fail this and be back on my butt like I was in 2013 with no place to stay. When I applied to medical school, I might go back to $20.86 that I took a picture of my second time after even the leader of the medical school said, you're not going to be a doctor. You're not going to get in with this. And then came back nine months later and said, please choose this school, not those other ones that offered you. What I'm trying to tell you is hope deferred makes the heart sick. And faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. A lot of times we have hope and we get disappointed. Faith is not your hope. It's the substance of what you hoped for. <laughs> so when you have the substance, that's the in-between. A lot of us in this room are in-between. Lord, you said this, I'm here. Talk about but you got the substance that you already there because Alpha and Omega, who's at the end, came back to your present and said, it's good. <laughs> Lastly, with this medicine thing, I want to testify. There was a woman in my clinic. Uh, my head doctor is a believer. This woman had eating disorders. This woman was in a mental institution. Uh, I hate that word, mental inst institution. She needed more help, right? She tried the medications. They were not working. She wouldn't eat. She was anorexic, BMI very low. The doctor called me in and said, we need some power. Can we do deliverance in this moment? <laughs> Revival is here, Acts 2. I was so stirred. I said, we're going to first repent in the name of Jesus. See, what you see here, you thought it was for 4805. You don't think it's outside of this place, but Acts 2 is outside of the four walls. I said, Lord, I call you into this room in the name of Jesus. If there be anything over this woman, I ask that you open her eyes. She accepted Jesus. We repented. She went through. In the middle of that, she called out stuff. The Lord showed us stuff. I said, oh, I see something hanging in your car. What's that? Oh, that's a dream catcher. Oh, I said, I see something on this uh, tablet over at your fireplace. Oh, at my mother's house. We do X, Y, Z. I said, I need you to call out this. Renounce this. Renounce that. In the middle, she said, oh, I got to run to the bathroom. Her bowels, she had deliverance. I called Fakir so stirred up in the car. I said, Fakir, the Lord just delivered a woman in a clinic. What I'm telling you is, we go to the doctor as if they're God. And I'm not telling you not to take your blood pressure medication. If you've been eating bad for 40 years, the Lord can deliver you, but you might need to get that blood pressure down. You might need it. But that blood pressure medication is not your source. That's the issue. If you are suicidal and you get on a medication and it stabilizes, I need you to know, just like everyone so eloquently said, yes. this medication is made for millions of people. Somebody needs this. Yes. If the Lord uses it, it's him using it. We're going to trust in him, though, because he's your source. I've seen people healed. I've seen God work miracles. Last testimony. I have to get it out because I promised God I would do this when he brought me out of this. I was so broken and shaken. In November, I tried. I pushed with everything in me. The enemy wants you to be so perfect and have so many accolades and be on so many platforms. You don't want to say when things went bad. But it's the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony that uh, testimony that will help others overcome. Fear of failure try to grip me. So when I fail, I promise God, I'm going to tell everybody. In November, I took three-hour exams back to back to back. I have intercessors praying. I'm praying. I'm going all in. One exam came 6% short. Now, I want you all to think, what physician would sit here in front of a camera and tell you, I fell short? What is the Lord doing? He's pulling perfectionism off. Yeah. 
Because if I tell you my resume, you'll say he's impressive. If I tell you what the Lord brought me out of, you'll point to him. I'm going to say it again. If I read you what I do on Monday, you'll be impressed. If I tell you about November, when I was in between the porch and the altar, when I was stuck in Florida and couldn't get to 4805. But at my lowest point, I get a text message in the middle of a prayer call. Apostle Alana said, oh, we're going to pray into this. I got that text message. I'm shaking. What am I telling you? That 11 weeks was breaking. I said, Lord, we're here again. You promised me. I said, Lord God, I've testified about you helping me overcome again. I've did all these things perfect. I did so many things. I'm studying to show myself approved. The next time I took the test, the Lord blessed me to get the 86 percentile. But check this. There's more. That's January. I needed that processing. I needed to go from that level of faith to faith. We like to say faith to faith, glory to glory. The testing of your faith produces perseverance so that you will be mature, perfected, and lack no good thing. We don't want to lack, but we don't want our faith to be tested. Lord, bring me to a new level of faith. The Lord comes Monday to test your faith. Oh, you left me over here by myself. And that was my testimony. Apostle called me. I, I, and, and, and you get an opportunity when you have a leader like this. You can sit there, but you're only going to sit there for about two seconds. Because you got to make a decision. The devil wants me to be a victim. The man looking at you testifying about the goodness of God can't be here testifying about his goodness if I say, woe is me. He left me over here by myself again. Because as a man think of, so is he. So when you have leaders like this, ooh, that pushes hard. Yeah, because your future is bigger than you. I said, God, you got too many thousands of people waiting on the manifestation of this promise. I'm going to testify. That woman right there taking care of that baby. The Lord blessed her with such a high percentile. He's dumbfounding the enemy. The Lord blessed me. They're sitting there. We're concerned with you. Even after I achieved real high, I said, what is going on? The Lord says, I'm preparing a table in front of you in the presence of your enemies. When a man's ways please God, he makes him to be even at peace. What is God doing through you? God is so hard. Yeah, you're a deliverer. Yes. <laughs> God, I'm, I, I don't know what's happening. I'm stretching you to carry more capacity. Yes. Now when the rain clouds come, you'll rebuke the rain. And this is going to go in every capacity of your life. This is not a church preach. In your relationships, in your prayer life, you'll be pushed. God still told me, press to get on that intercessor call. Press, press, press. Don't be coached by your disappointment. It, your trauma will become an idol if you sit there. Get up. And God is good, and that don't change because of your circumstances. Amen. Come on, give that praise. That was so good. That was so good. Wow. Should we take some questions or comments from the audience? Anybody? Let's take about five. You're saying we're out of time. Wow, that conversation that went was quick. quick. <laughs> Whoa, that was loaded. Let's talk to some of our audience members. Um, our congregation. I'm sorry, we're not in a talk show. But. <laughs> any, would anybody like to share, ask any of our panelists any questions? I see people wiping tears. I see deliverance has taken place, and I am so grateful. Anybody just wave at us. Okay, there we go. Thank you so much, Apostle. I love when you do couch conversation. Thank you. Um, because there's it's just so powerful. I have a, a thought that, um, so really quick, when I was in prison, I remember being approached by a spirit provoking me to homosexuality. Yeah. I denied that spirit access. I never gave in, I fought against it. So when I testify, I say, I know what it feels like to not give in to a pending temptation or a pending, you know, proclivity, right? I remember feeling like depression knocked my door. I remember saying this before. I remember feeling like depression knocked my door, but I pushed it back by the power of God. Is it possible? Now, this is then. That was 2002 through 2006. Uh -huh. Since then, when you guys describe symptoms, I identify with many of those symptoms at different points of my life. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, is it possible 
to be depressed, not know it, to maybe have the symptoms but not be whatever, what it's called when you have it as opposed to you do things that look like it. How can we identify if that's where we really are but you're just so accustomed to pushing through because I have a personality type that pushes through. Yeah. But yet I do feel, I have felt many of those symptoms at different times. How do we know? So can I, so real quick, um, there are levels to depression. So when you are being diagnosed with clinically depression, cl being clinically depressed, there's uh, mild, there is uh, a general, and then there's something that's called persistent. So that's having the symptoms over a long period of time. Um, that's the clinical answer. Now, related to what you were going through, woman of God, I feel like it was just a, a level of warfare. Um, and I think that you, what you did um, with fighting against it is what you should do. The easiest way to overcome something is do the opposite of what the thing is trying to tell you to do. And so if, if you are afraid or if you feel like you're depressed, the easiest thing to do to fight against that is to get up. If, it, if that depression is trying to tell you to go to sleep, then get up, right? That's what the, the uh, elder, elder Manny, bless his heart, was just saying to us. You know, you, got, you have to do the opposite of what's trying to hold you captive. And so what you did was fight against it. But there are levels. This is just from a clinical standpoint. There are levels to being diagnosed with depression. I have to ask a question, and I'm going to give it to Dr. Manny. Do you have any sy symptoms that are consistent all the time? Okay. And that's why I'm like, wait a minute, because sometimes sometime I fight, sometimes I don't fight. But oh. because I do fight, eventually I say I don't stop fighting. Okay. The Bible talks about be sober and vigilant. And, and what I do, um, it's, an act, it's an exercise. Uh, so the devil don't take Wednesday off. Uh, he don't take Friday off. He might change. You, he might come in a form of this coworker. He might come in a form of a thought. And, and he's trying to get you off. So... A lot of times, even as uh, uh, clinicians or a lot of times as people who study a lot, we know we're real good at diagnosing something, identifying them. What I like to do is apply the pressure of what works. If the Bible is a sword and it's going to cut something, I resist the devil. He has to flee. So daily, I would encourage anybody battling thoughts because we all do all day everywhere. And the issue is nobody saying that they are. But I resist this spirit right now in the name of Jesus. I identify, acknowledge you, and I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I apply the blood to my mind, and I'm going to think on this. And guess what happened? What I did? I battled depression all through my 14 years to get to this point from undergrad to now. The pressure of being great, the pressure of uh, you being the first, the pressure of the world hating the juice on your eyeballs and you don't know why they can see what's in you and you don't you can't see it in yourself lord why is it so hard because i am doing something inside of you i'm teaching you to fight so right now i fight different than i did then take up your weapons woman of god and we're going to fight with the weapons that work the weapons are warfare are not carnal but they're mighty to the pulling down of strongholds that that's a stronghold that needs to be rebuked and what you see apostle do here the corporate anointing Please don't come in, check in, and leave. I'm not saying you're doing this, but I'm speaking to even youth because that's my heart. Don't check in and leave and go home. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Yeah. Open your mouth. There ain't no junior Holy Spirit. I don't care if you've been a Christian for two days. If you saved, rebuke the devil, and he has to bow. And if he comes knocking at your door, that does not identify that you're still bound. It means you're fighting. You're fighting still. Yes. But Praise be to God who calls us to triumph. You're not fighting triumph. to lose. You're fighting because you don't fight fair because God's on your side. Yes. We're going to fight, and we're not going to look at the war as, dang, I'm messing up. No, we're called to fight.